So what I'd like to share with you today is uh, a few uh, thoughts about and some data about South Africa's energy situation, our level of oil dependence, uh, some of the, very briefly, the implications under a business as usual scenario, and then uh, some of the main mitigation options within the transport sector, which is the most important one uh, in, in terms of South Africa's oil consumption. So, pictures uh, till a thousand words. Our final energy consumption in South Africa, although primary energy is dominated by coal, which provides about 70%, in terms of final energy consumption, you can see that petroleum is the largest share, 31%. In terms of our oil import dependence, about two-thirds of our oil or petroleum fuels uh, rely on crude oil uh, imports, which are then refined in South Africa. Sasol, which you heard about yesterday perhaps, uh, produces about nearly a third of our liquid fuels from coal, in coal to liquids. And then the state oil company Petro say makes a small contribution from gas to liquids, uh, which it's been doing since the uh, early 1990s. Where does the petroleum get consumed? Most of it in the transport sector. Uh, small bits in agriculture, industry, residential. Uh, but the other sectors like industry are using electricity very intensively, coal-fired uh, electricity, and then coal in its raw form as well. Where do we get our oil from? Most of it, more than 90% from OPEC countries. And one of our main vulnerabilities at the moment is that around about a quarter at the moment of our oil supply is coming from Iran. And our, the South African government still does not have a plan of what to do about the sanctions that the uh, US and, and EU are, are, are set to impose on Iran uh, and their oil exports. So we hear constant news reports coming out saying that there are ongoing discussions between our government and the Iranian government and the US officials and European, but uh, there's still no clear indication. And one of the problems is that some of our refineries are specifically geared towards Iranian crude. We've been importing from them way back from the 1960s already. So uh, that presents somewhat of a challenge. Petroleum demand is very tightly coupled with GDP. Uh, I've done some econometric estimates and the relationship between uh, diesel consumption and GDP growth is more or less one to one between petrol consumption and, uh, and personal income is a bit less strong. There's more of a price dimension. But prices are not a big influence uh, for diesel consumption, which is uh, nearly half of our petroleum. So then some focus on the transport sector. You can see that road transport is totally dominant in terms of the usage of petroleum fuels. Rail, just 2%. Uh, that's for long haul, mostly uh, transporting coal and iron ore for export. Uh, passenger rail is, is almost non-existent in the country and that uses a little bit of electricity. And then air travel is another 10 11%. This data, unfortunately, is very old. Transport data is very poor in our country. Uh, so the numbers would have changed a bit since 2003, but the main take-home message is there is that about nearly half of the country of the population currently relies on walking and some of them bicycling to get to their places of work, school, etc. So mobility is very unequal in South Africa and this is one of the, uh, the, the messages I wanted to bring to the conference is that the situation in developing countries is very different from that in, uh, in advanced economies such as in Europe and, and North America. Uh, in terms of uh, motorized transport, you can see that quite a small share, just 15% uh, a few years ago was by car. That share would have risen a, a, uh, somewhat. Minibus taxis, these are 12, 15-seater taxis. These are the, the standard way that low-income people get around in our country. And uh, although they're much more efficient, well, they pile in a lot of people into these taxis. So they're much more efficient on a person... Uh, passenger kilometer per litre basis than a, than a sedan car, which is one advantage. Uh, freight transport is also heavily dependent on road. Uh, on a per ton basis, it's 80% of, 87% uh, of, uh, of freight is moved by road. Uh, on a ton kilometer basis, rail shares is higher, but that's just because of these long haul coal and iron ore export lines that I mentioned before. 
So the vulnerabilities then, we're already seeing the rising fuel prices uh, with the drop, of course, in the recession in 2009, which hit uh, our economy as, uh, along with most of the rest of the world. Uh, but otherwise, a fairly steady increase in, in fuel prices. Uh, you'll see at the moment that we're paying around about uh, just 11, 12 rand per litre. Uh, it's about 10, 11 rand to the euro. So just divide that by 10 and you get a picture of where our fuel prices are. So cheaper than you'd have here, but a little bit more expensive than the US. So the oil import bill is obviously a huge impact uh, on the economy. It's the single largest item on our import uh, uh, bill is the, is the oil imports, crude oil imports. And in 2008, that reached a high of about 6% um, of, uh, of GDP. And that seems to be something of a threshold now, uh, similar to in the US, where if, we, if the economy is paying more than 5 6% of, of GDP in t for, for oil, then uh, we're in, in a bit of trouble. The other aspect uh, that we anticipate is social strife. Uh, Robert Hirsch was mentioning this uh, a little bit earlier in his presentation. And already I mentioned our taxi sector. This sector is highly prone to violence. Uh, it's uh, often been alleged that it's sort of run by a kind of mafia type organizations. Uh, this was just a quote from really a week or two ago. They were protesting against a clampdown by uh, city metro police uh, on, on the taxi operators and drivers. Uh, they, they run up a couple of thousand rands worth of fines uh, per week on average. Um, so, uh, and you know, the guns come out, even machine guns, and uh, it gets quite chaotic. Uh, and they really brought the city to a standstill for a few days because of this protest. And, and rising fuel prices are feeding into this. I'm not going to explain this whole picture, but uh, just to mention that most of this presentation is based on my uh, PhD research, which has been uh, on the impacts and mitigation of, of peak oil in our country. Uh, these different critical infrastructure systems are highly interconnected. So when we get a shock to one of them, that shock is going to get transmitted to a lot of the other sectors as well. That's just the take-home message from that uh, spider's web. Then on to the mitigation side of it. The first place to start is on the demand side. That's going to be the, the low-hanging fruit, the cheapest, the quickest way to save fuel and to save on the oil import bill uh, is to reduce demand. And there's a lot of wastage in the system at present. I'm sure that's true for many other countries around the world as well. So there are a number of different techniques that one can apply, or different policies that can be introduced, uh, different measures. Uh, some of these are, are, are drawn from the International Energy Agency's work and also um, drawing on, on Robert Hirsch's work. Uh, Eco-driving is typically uh, expected to result in up to a 5% uh, fuel economy or fuel savings. Speed limit reductions are something that were introduced in the 1970s in our country as well as uh, some others like the U.S. Uh, they can uh, be, uh, have, have a few percentage point uh, savings. Carpooling for me is one of the big savers because so much of the petrol on a daily basis is used by single occupant uh, travelers commuting to and from places of work. Uh, and that's where the big savings can happen in the short term is by people carpooling. Uh, and uh, reducing the traffic, which will again bring additional de benefits of, of fuel, uh, fuel savings. Telecommuting is an option for uh, sort of white-collar workers, but in the context of a developing country like South Africa, its potential is actually f fairly limited. Although, of course, there's a higher correlation between uh, your sort of white-collar workers and car ownership, whereas most of the population, uh, nearly three-quarters, actually don't own or even have access to private motor vehicles. Uh, then there's some others like driving bans that which could be considered. The main point is that this is very co these measures are very cost effective. The government uh, would not have to spend much money to have a significant savings of fuel. And I think this will be applicable in most countries around the world. Then the second option for transport is to look more at the supply side and say, okay, well, what about if we change our types of vehicles that we're using, bring in more efficient vehicles, shift over from internal combustion engine vehicles to uh, electric vehicles, battery electrics, hybrids, etc. As uh, Dr. Hirsch said this morning, it takes a lot of time to do this. Uh, 
Uh, this graph shows you that blue line going up is the cumulative percentage of the, of the vehicle fleet, the private um, vehicle fleet that would be replaced. And that's based on an assumption that sales in about 2009, 2010 would decline by 5% a year. Now, from my perspective, that's a fairly optimistic assumption in terms of what the impact of, of peak oil will do to personal income um, of households and the affordability of new, new cars. And we know at the moment that hybrids and battery electric vehicles are on the higher end of the cost spectrum, uh, certainly in, for South Africans. Uh, so the point is it would take about 40 years to replace the car fleets that we have currently with more efficient vehicles with battery electrics and hybrids. So when it's looking at a long time and a lot of money that's uh, costing uh, over that time period. So it is an important thing to do, but it's not going to solve the problem by itself. Then just looking at some of the efficiency, and the next uh, <coughs> consideration is modal shifts, uh, a very important one. And based on the data that I could collect, one sees that battery electric buses, light rail trains, and electric bicycles way outperform uh, other modes in terms of the energy efficiency, and that's assuming maximum loading for these different modes of transport. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to uh, experience Vienna's public transport system. Uh, we just lack anything comparable to this in, in our country, uh, uh, and uh, it, it really shows what can be done if uh, the sensible investments are made. Uh, looking at from the other point of view, from energy costs, so comparing the electricity costs, which in South Africa historically were very cheap, uh, based on, on cheap coal, but have been rising at 25% a year for the last three years, and are set to do that for another few years as well. We've had electricity supply crises over the, over the last number of years. Uh, again, light rail trains, battery electric buses, and, and electric uh, scooters and bicycles uh, really come, come out uh, far and away. And, uh, other forms, uh, cars, uh, really not, not performing well at all in terms of cost. Uh, and then just finally to highlight again the issue of uh, maximum loading. Uh, it's really important to get as many people in a, in a four or five seater car as possible to, to improve the efficiencies. Uh, so you get a big difference there if you, if you fill up your, your car. Um, Again, battery electric vehicles in terms of uh, energy consumption and energy cost uh, are much better than, than your conventional ICE vehicles. Scooters and bicycles, again, uh, are the a way to go, certainly for, for city areas. So what I try to do is put these things together, uh, not assuming too much in terms of costing and affordability, but supposing we wanted to transition ourselves away from petroleum dependence. Uh, over a long time horizon, what might be feasible. And looking at all those different measures uh, and putting them together, uh, I thought from at least from a technical point of view, it would be feasible to replace uh, all of our uh, petroleum-based transports uh, over about a 40-year time horizon. Uh, it is possible for some of the, the measures to, to be ramped up more quickly, but a lot of them, if you're talking about uh, expanding your railways, uh, a lot of other modal shifts are going to take a number of, quite a number of years, um, and uh, the, the costs are going to be really significant. I wanted also then, um, okay, just tell you a little bit about how our government has been doing over the last few years in terms of any preparations for peak oil. Now, for the most part, uh, most uh, departments within the government are completely as either completely asleep or in denial. Uh, or, or, they, uh, or they're just not telling the public, as most national governments are around the world. One exception has been the Department of Transport. Uh, from about 2005, they started developing a 50-year transport master plan. They'd already been doing the work for about two years, uh, and then one of the co consultants asked me to give a presentation on peak oil to the group. And, they weren't taking energy into consideration at all at that stage in the, in the process of development, not from a climate change point of view or from an oil depletion point of view. So they were rather rudely shocked when, uh, when I broached the subject of peak oil to them. But it does seem to have had some impact because there's been a renewed uh, focus on upgrading the railways in the country since then. And so some of the strengths are that we have this transport master plan that is looking to the long-term future. 
Uh, recently, the government's announced that they'll be spending 128 billion rand over the next 18 years in upgrading and recapitalizing the, the railways. Uh, that's just the passenger railway system, which at the moment you know, really transports about 2.5% of, of commuters daily, which is a really small fraction. Uh, Transnet, which is the state-owned uh, uh, freight uh, um, company, is uh, also embarking on a, a massive expansion, uh, spending about 300 billion rand over the next uh, seven years or so in upgrading its, its rail infrastructure. However, most of that is actually geared towards increasing exports of coal and iron ore. So it's based on the old growth model, uh, assumption that uh, world trade will continue to increase at a few percentage points a year, and so on. Whereas only a small fraction of that is actually devoted to general freights uh, movement uh, goods within the country. But my view is that uh, when circumstances change, they can, to a large extent, use those locomotives for general goods um, freight instead of, uh, instead of exports. They're also encouraging developments around bus rapid transit systems in a number of the metro areas. About three of the or four of the metros are developing BRT systems, uh, which are uh, very much more energy efficient, at least, than private passenger transport. And then there's a small bicycle project, mainly in rural areas. In my view, that's something that should be ramped up quite dramatically. But on the other hand, there's some weaknesses as well. Uh, the government spent a lot of money refurbishing, expanding, and even building one completely new airport, uh, mostly around the 2010 World Cup soccer, which was held in South Africa. So on the one hand, the, the World Cup event stimulated developments in BRT and, and other transport, but it also locked the country into the old mode uh, of planning for increasing international tourism, which is really under threat from rising oil prices. Similarly, ongoing subsidies to the national air carrier, SA Airways, which are now asking for another 6 billion rand to buy new aircraft for the future. My view is that that's not a good, wise investment. Also, freeway expansions, 25 billion rand for new roads. They've been, they spent about 25 billion rand over the last few years expanding freeways around Gauteng, which is the main industrial uh, area in the country. Now there's a huge uh, set of tensions because uh, the trade unions, which are very powerful uh, within the government and society, uh, even the opposition party, they're opposing uh, e-tolling, so tolling of these new um, uh, freeways. So the government always planned to recoup the money from, from private users, and now they're facing a huge political problem. Uh, and I think that's partly a result of the increasing fuel prices. People don't want to have to pay another uh, sort of 50 cents a kilometer traveled uh, from toll roads. And then we had a local company developing a, a, an electric car and the government sank about 300 million rand into that. In my view, that's a waste of money because there are much bigger motor vehicle companies around the world that are bringing out uh, electric vehicles and hybrids all the time. Now they're considering changing that company into uh, making battery electric buses, which uh, might be a better investment. But again, they're wanting government uh, money for that. And then uh, the last one is we've got a, a short section of under 100 kilometers of, of rapid rail that was built firstly to connect um, Johannesburg's airport with the city center, uh, and then connecting the cities of Johannesburg and Pretoria. Uh, so they spent about another 25 billion rand uh, on less than 100 kilometers of rapid rail. And again, it's to serve, mostly to serve the upper income segments, whereas they should be, in my view, spending much more money on improving mobility for those people who have very little access to mobility at the moment. So to conclude, South Africa, as are many countries in the world, is highly vulnerable to rising oil prices and, and oil scarcity in the future. If they continue on a business as usual trajectory, the impacts will be severe. Uh, there are a lot of details which uh, I can provide if anyone's interested um, through the research. Mitigation is both urgent and it's viable. Uh, I won't say a complete uh, solving of, of, of the issue, but there are many things that can do. I've only looked here at, uh, uh, at transport, but in my research I've also looked at the agriculture sector, macroeconomic policy, 
uh, social interventions around uh, maintaining equity like rationing systems, etc. But a combination in transport of the demand side management, uh, replacing the vehicle fleet, fleet with more efficient alternatives, uh, public transit and the shifting freight to rail can really save us a lot of fuel and a lot of uh, money spent on importing crude oil. And all of these will be really important to keep the economy functioning and uh, also for preserving social stability in the face of these shocks. So uh, again, thanks for the opportunity. And perhaps the last thing I wanted to say was bring, uh, following on from the discussion this morning. In my view, if you're going to sell a peak oil message, you have to at the same time give people some hope or at least some action items. This is what you can do about it. If you only sell, tell them oil is going to be depleting for all of these reasons and these are going to be the shocks to the economy and to your lifestyle, you are probably going to be met with a psychological response of denial uh, and inaction as a defense mechanism. Whereas if you give people some practical, uh, if not solutions, at least uh, things that they can do both in their personal lives and at a, uh, at a broader societal level, I think we'll get a much better response uh, and uh, offset some of the hardships that we may be facing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. I can get a few hands in the air for people who'd like to ask questions. Just one to Shell here and then Richard at the back. Yeah, just give it some time, it comes on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, Kat, yes. Uh, I think uh, Africa is a continent that we must work with more and uh, be, be more in focus. And uh, the thing is that uh, Africa has the oil they need to improve the quality of life, but uh, uh, nowadays uh, these all go to uh, other areas outside Africa, and I think uh, that's a very important uh, point uh, I'd like to make at this point. Uh, the other thing is that uh, if you look at the infrastructure of Africa, you see the railroads in general are going from the center of the country into the, out of the coast, because that was the export roads, you know. So um, uh, I have an idea that uh, there should be a, a new railroad along the coast of Africa uh, so you could travel by rail around Africa because you cannot do it today. Uh, what's your opinion about that? I totally agree with you on the way it is at the moment that uh, Africa is really seen by the rest of the world as a, uh, a treasure trove of resources. Uh, China, the United States in particular are heavily involved in, in, in most of the continent in extracting resources, oil, many other natural resources. Uh, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, the resource curse is at work, and so the, the money that does come in from selling the resources uh, gets uh, controlled by an elite, and so it's not going into social investment projects like railways. Uh, there are exceptions. Uh, the Chinese tend to uh, strike deals where they get oil in in exchange for building railways, often again, so that they can export the resources. But if those governments could act in the social interest, then I think there would be potential for constructing a bigger network of railways, which is vital if Africa is going to realize its potential, its economic potential. Uh, because at the moment, trade on the continent is very hamstrung by the lack of transport infrastructure. Uh, the other thing for Africa is that there is potential for leapfrogging. We know from peak oil that it's impossible for Africa to follow the path of Europe in, and North America in terms of industrial development. It has to do it a different way. And, uh, you know, some examples are like in telecommunications. It's instead of going fixed line, it's just gone straight to, to mobile networks. Uh, we have to look at other ways that we can leapfrog Afri Africa, invest in more sustainable technologies, infrastructures right from the beginning. Uh, I think the political management is, is perhaps the greatest weakness uh, in Africa at the moment. And there are no easy solutions to that. Richard? 
Uh, Richard Miller, no particular affiliation at the moment. Uh, Jerry, uh, thank you for the, the presentation. This is the second time this morning that we've heard this word rationing, uh, which is one of those horribly unfashionable words that we may be hearing a lot more of in the near future. And I just want to make a couple of observations about rationing. It's not really a questioning question. Uh, firstly, I've lived in a, in a society under fuel rationing. I lived just north of you for a while in what was then Rhodesia, uh, where rationing was severe. I believe I had a 20 liter a month allowance, um, you know, which is not a great deal. But you, you, you notice that the, the so whether you can talk about social stability in what was then Rhodesia is a separate question. But the point is, it wasn't the fuel issues that that, that created a great problem. It it still remained a functionable society in terms of fuel supply with rationing in place. If you go back before that to the Second World War, uh, again, the UK had uh, fuel rationing for, for some years, and this did not bring society down. It was regarded as a necessary thing, and I like the way that you said this is required for social stability. If you allow the market to do rationing, then I think you are looking at, at some enormous social stresses that, that society won't, won't, won't stand for. So... As I say, this is more a comment than a, than a question, but if, you'd, if you would like to comment back on, on wh what you think the possibilities for rationing in Western or developed societies are, I'd be interested to hear. I, I totally agree that if you allow the market to do the rationing, because essentially it's a different form of rationing, if, the, if you allow market prices to do it, it allocates the fuel to the upper income segments. And they can, people can, the rich people can continue driving the SUVs or whatever else uh, and uh, using up a lot of fuel, whereas lower income people might not be able to afford any. That is going to create social uh, tensions. Uh, in a country like mine, where you've got already one of the worst uh, cases of income and wealth inequality in the world, uh, it, it's a, a really strong flashpoint. So I think that. Uh, I, I really think that rationing is going to come back in fashion. I think it's a, uh, a fairly sensible response to, to what we're going to be facing. Uh, I think in societies that are reasonably homogenous and, and, and democratic, uh, I think most people will accept it as a, as a necessary form of dealing with the situation. Uh, I think uh, in, an, in other societies where perhaps there's higher levels of corruption, and, uh, and crime, it's going to be more difficult to implement because you're going to get black markets developing. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, we're already here this morning about instances in America of hijacking of fuel trucks, and, and I can see a lot of that happening in, in, in some countries as well, possibly my own as well, unfortunately. But uh, I, I think rationing should be on the table along with all the other... Uh, with all the other mechanisms, because one way or another rationing is going to happen. So let's rather try and do it on a more democratic basis. Okay. Well, okay. I'm just going to take one question here, and maybe we'll see how we go for time. Whether we've got two more. So, yep. Is it is yours a response to the rationing? No, I have another question regarding something. Okay. We'll see how we go for time. Just a quick okay. question response. Um, my question is, um, you mentioned that um, electric trolley buses are less uh, cost-effective than battery electric buses. Um, and I'm wondering why, so I'm a bit puzzled, because uh, the electric trolley doesn't have the storage problem and works very well with uh, renewable sources. Uh, it's... it's I, I base the calculations on, on data that I could get hold of for, for the different modes of transport. It's possible that some of them were out, out of date or, you know, there might be differences between different particular uh, models of vehicle, etc. So I'm very open to, to correction on, on that. But, you know, you've got issues around the infrastructure that's, that's available, uh, the cost of, the, uh, of building the, the, the electrical supply lines versus the, the storage. And... Uh, you know that those factors are uh, are changing as different technologies emerge, emerge with batteries and so on. So, uh, but both of those technologies seem to outperform many of the other alternatives. So I think that's 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 one thing we can say. And the advantage compared with building, say, new railways, of course, is that you can use existing roadways, convert them, more easily put tram lines down. Uh, or use battery electric buses on existing roadways, which will save you on infrastructure costs. 
very quickly. Hi, Jeremy. My name is Daniel. I wanted to ask you, uh, when we talk about uh, transportation, we normally um, are thinking about increasing efficiency and substituting fuel with something different. But uh, one of the most crucial points is to make transport um, unnecessary. So uh, I'm focused in urban farming and vertical farming. And my question to you is, um, can you shortly explain me the situation of food production system in South Africa? Uh, very, very important area. So uh, in my research, I, I looked at agriculture and the, and the food system in, in quite a lot of detail. Uh, we, our agricultural system in, the, in, in South Africa is largely an industrial one. 90, 95% of, of um, food production is uh, fossil fuel intensive industrial agriculture, as you'd find in the US and, and, and parts of Europe. So it's very vulnerable. Uh, even more than that, it's a fairly big country with settlements being spread wide apart. And so there's a lot of movement. Uh, and most of that movement of agricultural produce is now by road in trucks rather than by rail. Uh, fortunately, just a week or two ago, Transnet, the, the, the state-owned um, freight company, said it's going to be investing uh, money in upgrading the railway specifically for the transport of agricultural goods. But it's me been neglecting that for decades now. They've let the railway slide down and deteriorate for decades. So they've got a lot of work and a lot of money to spend on, on upgrading it. But it's, for me... Uh, probably after the the initial response to people of people to to higher fuel prices, the uh, the most important one is is how we're going to get food uh, to to people's uh, cupboards and and tables. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm going to draw it to a close there. I think Jeremy. I'm sure we'll be happy to answer your question at lunch if you can find him. Thank you very much, Jeremy.